All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. Um, and I will be providing the tech support for today. Um, I will let Cindy handle the, the introduction. And uh, before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, this is what your dashboard should look like. Um, if you do not see this dashboard, look for this orange box with a white arrow either at the top left or right hand side of your screen. That button will open and close the dashboard and it's possible the dashboard loaded closed on you. Um, if you are on a laptop or desktop and do not see the screen um, that I'm sharing or your dashboard, um, look for a blue clover type icon in the bottom of your taskbar. Um, if you were working in another program, it's possible that it didn't get brought up. You can just click on that icon and then that should uh, that should bring up GoToWebinar. Um, if you're working on a mobile device, um, if you're having any problems, you can let me know and hopefully we'll be able to take care of that. At any point during the program, if you are running into issues, you can use this raise hand button here. That'll alert me and I will get in contact with you and hopefully be able to solve that. And we will be taking questions at the end of the program today, but please feel free to submit them at any time. And you can use that using this questions box here. Just type in your question, hit send. Um, that'll get sent to us and we'll be happy to answer that at the end of the program. Um, that is everything that I have. So I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy. Hi everybody, I hope you're doing well today and thank you so much for joining with us. Um, you know, when we were planning a, a date for this talk, as I was uh, looking back to, to see what to put here in the bio and the, and the welcome, uh, our presenter, Paul Soltis, suggested that this was a good date, January 6th, um, it, you know, also to come off the holidays, 12th night, but uh, in 1759, George Washington married Martha. And the Wallace House served as Washington's winter headquarters during the Revolutionary War. So if Martha and George were uh, still alive today, they would be celebrating their 262nd anniversary. There's a little bit of trivia for you to use with somebody to start a conversation later. Um, you know, and we're also, with this talk, still remembering that it's been 100 years since the 19th Amendment was ratified. And so we're gonna hear some suffrage stories as well. Uh, one of our upcoming webinars, is on June 11th, and I know it might interest a lot of you in the genealogy research area. It's gonna be from two to 3 p.m. and it's about finding, procuring, and preserving your images. And, uh, you know, I think that that's something, you know, as, as technology moves so quickly and that some of us still have our VHSs and stuff like that. I just aged myself, didn't I? But uh, yes, I have seen cassettes. Uh, and eight tracks, so there you go. Our next talk is for Black History Month and is gonna be on February 3rd. I am in the process of putting it up on our website, so it should be there later today. The presenter is Sandra Turner Barnes. She is a historian and author and a poet. Uh, she's the former executive director of the Camden County Cultural and Heritage Commission. And the, the title of it is Little Known Truths Regarding African American Enslavement Within the State of New Jersey, 1690, to 1866. So that's going to be on February 3rd. But today I am very happy to have with us Paul Soltis. Paul is the State Park Services Resource Interpretive Specialist at Wallace House and the Old Dutch Parsonage. There are state historic sites and they're in Somerville, New Jersey. He holds a BA from William and Mary and a certificate from the National Institute of American History and Democracy in Williamsburg, Virginia. So Paul, we are Glad to turn it over to you now and uh, listen for these stories and this presentation that you're going to share with us. Thank you so much for being with us today. Looks like you're muted, Paul. Uh, there we go. There we um, I'll just say hello before we go into our slideshow. My, yeah, I'm Paul from our State Park Service, and it's great. Cindy uh, says it's 12th night today, and it's uh, George and Martha Washington's wedding anniversary. And, and that's not a coincidence, uh, because 12th night was really the most festive day in terms of parties and celebrations for the Christmas season, uh, rather than Christmas Day, which was a more solemn day of prayer. Uh, oftentimes, families would be gathered together for that time, and uh, and that's why weddings right, uh, will often take place then, since everyone's already uh, together for the holiday. 
And uh, today we will be thinking about Washington's headquarters, but thinking of it as Martha Washington's headquarters, sort of looking at the perspective uh, from the history of these women. And with that um, uh, anniversary year that we've just concluded, 100 years since the passage of the 19th Amendment, uh, we'll think about uh, women's suffrage in New Jersey, uh, which actually was a return to suffrage, at least in a limited sense. New Jersey had women's suffrage in the 18th century. So uh, we will go ahead and begin here. And I'm usually coming to you from uh, Wallace House and Old Dutch Parsonage uh, State Historic Sites in Somerville, New Jersey. I'm excited to be um, here sharing online today. Uh, I care for, uh, we will the State Park Service cares for two historic houses in Somerville. We'll use the Old Dutch Parsonage as our frame today to start and end our, our discussion. Uh, the Old Dutch Parsonage was built in 1751 and it was the home of ministers of the Dutch Reformed Church uh, in New Jersey. Two, del two men from this house, Frederick Frelinghuysen and the Reverend Jacob Rutzen Hardenberg were delegates to the Provincial Congress of New Jersey in 1776. So as the Continental Congress was deliberating American independence in Philadelphia, uh, just up the river at Burlington, the Provincial Congress was debating uh, independence for New Jersey. They resolved for independence uh, in June 1776, and then on July 2nd, they adopted New Jersey's first constitution. And this constitution contained a unique clause that it did include limits on suffrage or voting rights according to wealth. So a voter had to be worth uh, 50 pounds proclamation money, but it did not include any restrictions based on race or sex. And um, this is very unique. It was, New Jersey was the only of the 13 colonies um, that permitted, in limited cases, suffrage to women and, uh, and to free women and men of color uh, during and after the American Revolution in the um, 17, 80s and 90s, uh, New Jersey, the legislature passed additional statutes that confirmed that this was not just an accident. You know, the, it doesn't necessarily mention women outright, the legislation, the constitution, it just said all inhabitants. So it, it, did, not, it, just, it did not restrict them. Right? You know, it doesn't name them outright, but the later documents do in fact reinforce this. And it says by name, women, and uh, mentions he or she in reference to voting rights. So women who could meet that property qualification were able to vote um, for the first three decades of New Jersey's statehood. Uh, that voting right ended in 1807 uh, when the legislature, which was consisted entirely of men, uh, passed a new law that restricted suffrage to men and white men in particular alone. And so uh, black men would not vote again in New Jersey until the passage of the um, of, of amendments to the Constitution after the Civil War. Um, Thomas Mundy Peterson of Perth Amboy was the first uh, man of color to vote under the amendment to the United States Constitution anywhere in the United States. And then, of course, uh, 100 years ago last year, uh, the 19th Amendment extended women's suffrage nationwide. But through our old Dutch parsonage, we have uh, two two links to the first constitution of New Jersey, which did grant women limited suffrage. So with that kind of as the background to New Jersey's entrance into the American Revolution, our main focus today will be um, a house, and here are Colonel Frederick Freilinghuysen and the Reverend Jacob Ritson Hardenberg. Uh, Reverend Hardenberg uh, is most notable as the founder and first president of Queens College, which is today Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. And uh, Colonel Frederick Freilinghuysen uh, his stepson uh, was a um, officer in the Continental Army and the first instructor at Queens College. New Jersey's first constitution adopted in 1776. Uh, we are presently on our third constitution adopted in the 20th century. But across the street at this unique sort of dual historic site uh, where I work is the Wallace House. The Wallace House was the private home of a Philadelphia merchant called John Wallace, who really left the city of Philadelphia in the opening years of the Revolutionary War to escape the fighting. 
Well, moving to the middle of New Jersey to escape the Revolutionary War was not a very prescient idea on Mr. Wallace's part. And the house uh, was uh, rented to the Continental Army for George Washington's use in uh, 1778 to 1779. This winter camp was called the Middlebrook Cantonment, with the army based around the Watchung Mountains in Somerset County. And of course, uh, we often think of these military headquarters as, as very male dominated spaces with the generals and officers who were exclusively men at this time. But we'll explore the house today from a different perspective, from the perspective of women, uh, 10 different women who in freedom and in slavery lived and uh, labored here uh, during the period in which the house was General Washington's headquarters. We'll approach the house from the perspective of the other uh, Washington who stayed here, Martha Washington. Uh, this is a view of the Wallace House in the snow uh, from the drive. What from the drive? Uh, there was once a drive that extended from what is today Somerset Street, and is uh, now, excuse me, what is today Somerset Street, and is uh, was then the Old York Road up to the house. George Washington arrived at the Wallace House in December of 1778. He stayed um, for just about two weeks and then he uh, left uh, to Philadelphia. And it was in Philadelphia during that sort of Christmas time season that he reunited uh, with Martha Washington. Mrs. Washington had uh, journeyed three times by this point in the war to join her husband at headquarters. And she's 47 years old when she arrives at this Middlebrook cantonment. Uh, by November 2nd, 1778, she conceded that she had some reason to expect that I shall take another trip to the northward. The poor general is not likely to come to see us from what I can hear. So by November 11th of 1778, uh, George Washington was arranging plans for Martha's annual visit to headquarters. In fact, the springs on Mrs. Washington's carriage were in disrepair, and General Washington blamed uh, the uh, disrepair on the negligence of her son, Jackie Custis. Mrs. Washington departed Mount Vernon and reached Philadelphia by December uh, the 12th, uh, 1778, when she was a guest of honor at a ball at the New Tavern in Philadelphia. General Washington, taking a break from headquarters at the Wallace House, reunited with Mrs. Washington in Philadelphia in late December. And during that year's Christmas season, they met the French minister, Monsieur Gerard, and the Spanish minister, uh, Don Juan de Morales. So Mrs. Washington enjoyed the Christmas season and January in Philadelphia with her husband, and she would finally arrive to the Wallace House in early February of 1779. Martha and George Washington left Philadelphia for Middlebrook, and Mrs. Washington traveled up the drive here and arrived to the Wallace House. While at headquarters, Mrs. Washington wrote frequently to her son and daughter-in-law, Jackie and Nellie Custis, confirming she and her husband were well, uh, but requesting more regular updates from them about the affairs at home. On March 31st, 1779, while Mrs. Washington was here at the Wallace House, her daughter-in-law, Mrs. Custis, gave birth to a daughter also called Nellie Custis. Nellie Custis would become uh, most notable as a, as a granddaughter and in effect adopted daughter of George and Martha Washington and would live with them in the presidential mansions uh, during George Washington's presidency. So the first lady of this emerging nation long before that term was ever used, Martha Washington entertained officers and diplomats at headquarters. On February 18th, 1779, she attended festivities and fireworks, which General Henry Knox hosted at the Pluckman Cantonment, just to the north of the Wallace House in present-day Bedminster Township, uh, in celebration of the French Alliance. On May 1st, she welcomed Monsieur Gerard and Don Juan de Morales, the um, French and Spanish ministers, to headquarters, and the next day attended military exercises in their honor. On May 14th, that spring, Mrs. Washington witnessed a parade of the army given in honor of American Indian chiefs visiting camp. And in June, uh, Martha Washington, in the words of her husband, quote, according to custom, marched home 
when the campaign was about to open, end quote there. So General Washington in his correspondence being a little bit clever, uh, but saying that basically Martha Washington would spend the winters uh, with her husband. And then when campaigning resumed uh, in the summer months, she would leave camp and return home. Uh, in this uh, June, she traveled by way of Easton and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So she actually kind of took a route out around Pennsylvania uh, before returning to Mount Vernon by early July. In all, Martha Washington spent a little less than half the Revolutionary War away from home. Within five months of her return from the Wallace House, she was back on the road to New Jersey to join her husband in headquarters at the Ford Mansion in Morristown for the Continental Army's winter camp at Jockey Hollow of course, preserved today at Morristown National Historical Park. Um, so Martha Washington uh, herself, uh, throughout the war, a very present figure in the headquarters of her husband, the commander in chief. So that was the mistress of Mount Vernon, but what about the mistress of Hope Farm? Hope Farm, the name that the Wallace family gave to their estate in New Jersey, on which the Wallace house um, sat. Uh, the mistress of Hope Farm was Mary Wallace, and here I've, um, in blue I'll have the uh, members of the people in the house who are associated with the Continental Army with Washington's military family, in green the Wallace family, the um, more or less permanent residents of the home, who are living side by side. Mary Wallace uh, was the daughter of Mary and Joshua Maddox. She was born in Philadelphia in 1732 the same year in which George Washington was born. Already well established by her birth into Philadelphia society, Mrs. Wallace's marriage to the Scottish emigrant John Wallace may have helped her secure an even firmer financial position in the city. So marrying a wealthy merchant, of course, is, uh, uh, brings plenty of money to the equation, but even uh, just by her own birth, Mary Wallace uh, was, was, was prominent in uh, Philadelphia which is again the, the largest and uh, the largest city of the North American colonies in, of Britain before the Revolutionary War. Mrs. Wallace lived in several townhouses in Philadelphia before the outbreak of the Revolutionary War prompted her removal with her husband to what we call the Wallace House at Hope Farm in New Jersey. Mrs. Wallace remained in residence during General Washington's stay, although she had to accept her husband as a roommate in her bedchamber uh, which you see pictured here, to make space in his usual bedchamber for the Commander-in-Chief's accommodation. We do have two separate bedchambers in the Wallace House for Mr. and Mrs. Wallace. It is not a sign of marital discord, uh, but simply a reflection of a practice that was common in the 18th century, at least among the wealthy, uh, who afford, could afford um, such large spaces in their homes, uh, keeping in mind a home the size, perhaps, of one of the bed chambers in the Wallace House would probably be pretty comfortable for many colonial American families. When Martha Washington arrived at camp, she requested use of an additional chamber for an upstairs sitting room. The only remaining space was the bed chamber for Mrs. Wallace's mother, Mrs. Maddox, who we'll meet in a little bit. Uh, Mrs. Wallace uh, permitted the broad use of her home for General Washington but she refused to see the removal of her mother from the house. And here the mistress of Hope Farm triumphed over the mistress of Mount Vernon. And Mrs. Washington received a very rare no to one of her requests. After General Washington's departure, Mrs. Wallace stayed at Hope Farm. Following the deaths of her husband and her mother in 1783, Mrs. Wallace died here at home on January 9th, 1784. She was 53 years old. Mrs. Wallace was buried at St. Peter's Church in Philadelphia alongside her late husband, returned in death to the city where she had spent so much of her life. So um, really a New Jersey figure only for the interlude of the Revolutionary War, Mary Wallace returns in death to Philadelphia. We'll move downstairs into the house and as we go through the house from the perspective of these women, we'll sort of get a little bit of a tour as well uh, while our buildings are closed. Uh, Catherine Green, uh, did not stay at the Wallace House, but she sure um, was a visitor as part of the Continental Army's encampment. Catherine Green was 25 years old when George Washington stayed at the Wallace House, and she was among the youngest of the ladies at camp. Mrs. Green, uh, the wife of uh, uh, Nathaniel Green, stayed nearby at Van Vechten House, 
which was the headquarters of her husband, General Green, and is today the headquarters of the Somerset County Historical Society. And so Van Vechten House uh, remains standing today. Mrs. Green was especially active among the officers' wives at camp, and very much unlike Martha Washington, Mrs. Green regretted the boredom of life at home with her children and longed to join the social life of camp. So as most of the wives of these officers, it was uh, an inconvenience to have to get up and move with the army. Of course, for um, Catherine Green, who gets 25 years old, this was a really exciting opportunity to be able to get out, be among society, and incredible to think about that in the midst of a, a war and all the uh, uh, difficulties these soldiers were enduring, but it gives you some, some glimpse into the experience of at least uh, this officer's wife. Dancing was a major part of entertainment for officers and ladies at camp, and country dancing in two long lines took place in passages like this one in the Wallace House just beyond the front door. So you're seeing inside the Wallace House uh, as if you just stepped in through the front door. And this is a very impressive uh, central passage with um, some great architectural uh, features still intact. And uh, thinking of country dancing in this period, two long lines moving up and down, a central passage like this one is a perfect venue uh, to hold those kinds of dances. On one occasion in March of 1779, Mrs. Green danced upwards of three hours with none other than General Washington without once sitting down in the recollection of her husband. In May 1779, the Spanish minister, Don Juan de Morales, sent gifts to George and Martha Washington from Philadelphia, thanking them for hosting him earlier in the month at headquarters. And he included an itemized list of the gifts, marking some for General Washington, others for Mrs. Washington, and a single present for Mrs. Green. Uh, so the gifts to his host are customary, but he threw in one extra gift for Mrs. Green. Uh, so she obviously uh, was impressive to not only General Washington, but uh, many of the visitors at headquarters. Mrs. Green joined Martha Washington for a visit to Morristown on May 31st, 1779. And when Mrs. Washington returned to headquarters, Mrs. Green departed home for Rhode Island leaving behind what, at least to her, was another exciting winter at camp. Let's move back upstairs um, into the bedchamber used uh, uh, for um, Martha Washington and George Washington. Uh, but we also have additional women here too, and those are the enslaved maids of Martha Washington. At headquarters in New Jersey, at home at Mount Vernon, and from her birth in Virginia, enslaved labor and enslaved women were essential to Martha Washington's daily life. At Mount Vernon, enslaved maids dressed and undressed Mrs. Washington, and her day revolved around the supervision of enslaved labor. When Mrs. Washington was not monitoring enslaved cooks in the kitchen or dining at a table served by enslaved waiters, she gathered enslaved girls and women in her bedroom to sew, knit, and make clothes. Enslaved maids journeyed with Mrs. Washington to headquarters throughout the Revolutionary War including here at the Wallace House. These girls and women faced even more fiercely than Mrs. Washington, the ardor of travel on rough and undeveloped roads, sometimes through snow and ice as weather conditions worsened with the approaching winters. They did not receive the same celebratory welcomes as their mistress as they passed through cities and towns, but they did share with Mrs. Washington an experience of whole new parts of the world beyond Virginia. It's interesting to think, um, about what this experience was you know, for these women and in far too many cases for these girls really, who were now for the first time seeing a world uh, beyond uh, the plantation life uh, they knew at Mount Vernon. We don't know the names of the enslaved maids who labored here at the Wallace House with Mrs. Washington, but they would have been in spaces like this one in Martha Washington's bedchamber on the second floor. The most well-known of Martha Washington's maids own a judge who's noted for her successful escape from slavery in the president's mansion in Philadelphia, was born in slavery at Mount Vernon in 1774, and was only about four years old when Martha Washington came to the Wallace House. Um, Ona was about 10 years old in 1784, just after the Revolutionary War, when she started working as a personal maid to Mrs. Washington. So we can wonder what relationships these girls and women forged with each other, 
um, what affairs of the Continental Army they overheard, you know, working right here in the midst of the commander in chief's headquarters, and how they interacted with the other free and enslaved black and white servants here at the Wallace House and what they thought of their own rare experience to travel beyond the confines of Virginia to see New Jersey and a larger world. Another women, woman who traveled um, with Washington's um, headquarters was Margaret Thomas. Margaret Thomas, and again, for these women with whom we don't have a, uh, an illustration or a portrait, I've kind of chosen pictures, sites inside the house that um, recall their work or their experience. Um, Margaret Thomas entered service in Washington's headquarters at Cambridge in February 1776. Uh, Margaret Thomas was a free black woman from Philadelphia. Um, she worked as a seamstress, sewing clothes for other servants in Washington's headquarters, and then took on additional work as a washerwoman, receiving payment for washing done at least through April 1779, when headquarters was here at the Wallace House. Uh, also known as Peggy Lee, Margaret Thomas developed a close relationship with George Washington's enslaved valet and bodyguard, William Lee. They were most likely married, although their marriage was unrecognized by George Washington and the laws of the time. While George Washington developed a close attachment to Billy Lee, uh, he did not share this fondness for Margaret uh, Thomas. After the war in 1784, Billy Lee requested General Washington arrange for Margaret's removal to Mount Vernon, where he could care for her in her illness. And we only have limited documents, right? But it seems that um, somehow Billy was aware that uh, Margaret was unwell, and he asks uh, General Washington if um, she could move to Mount Vernon and live with him there. General Washington wrote of Margaret that, quote, I never wished to see her more, but he affirmed, quote, I cannot refuse his request on account of the fidelity Billy Lee demonstrated for him during the Revolutionary War. So was George Washington uncomfortable with Margaret Thomas's status as a free black woman? Uh, did he fear that association with her would prompt Billy Lee's own agitation for freedom from slavery? We see how intense the relationship is between Billy Lee and George Washington, while always divided, of course, by that essential difference of a slaveholder and someone in slavery. Um, and yet he sort of, he has this sense of um, fidelity to him, but it does not extend beyond favoritism, right? Favoritism does not mean he was an anti-racist. And so he remains uncomfortable with the notion of his association with a free black woman. It remains unknown if Margaret ever reunited with Billy Lee at Mount Vernon, but we do know she lived for some time after the war in Philadelphia with Hannah and Isaac Till, who also served in Washington's headquarters, and we'll talk about in a little bit. The bonds forged by black servants in freedom and slavery in Washington's service were strong enough to outlast the Revolutionary War. When Margaret Thomas needed a home, she found one with Hannah and Isaac Till, with whom she had labored here at the Wallace House. So these people don't just know each other for the time they're here. Um, these relationships last beyond this headquarters. Uh, Phyllis, served three generations of the Maddox and Wallace family in slavery in Philadelphia. Uh, when Mary Maddox and the Wallace family left Philadelphia to their new home at Hope Farm in the opening years of the Revolutionary War, uh, they compelled Phyllis to depart with them. This move forced Phyllis to abandon close friends, or most likely even family, um, after decades living in Philadelphia. We know that uh, even in slavery, um, perhaps even more importantly, because she's in slavery, Phyllis would have a network of support and very likely family within the city. Of course, when the Wallace family decides to leave, however, she comes along. We have no um, record of what, if any, view she held on that decision to leave. Whether a talented cook or an able lady's maid, Phyllis was a skilled domestic servant. While additional enslaved and hired servants entered the Wallace House when George Washington was in headquarters, Phyllis continued her work alongside them for the Wallace and Maddox family. If Phyllis was a cook, she continued to prepare meals in the house's kitchen for the family to take in the dining room, while General Washington's servants labored in a temporary kitchen and dining room constructed on the rear of the house. If she was a lady's maid to Mrs. Maddox, Phyllis's duties surely increased 
as Mrs. Maddox aged towards a full century of life during General Washington's stay. We know the name of Phyllis, and we know that as someone who um, was enslaved to the family for so many decades, she must have been a, uh, a skilled a domestic servant, but the exact nature of her assignments are unknown. John Wallace may have held additional women and girls in slavery at Hope Farm. A property tax record from 1781 indicates the presence of an enslaved man at Hope Farm, but these records often omit women and girls. In 1783, Mr. Wallace, in his will, refers to the people he held in slavery only as, in quote, my stock of Negroes, indicating the continued practice of slavery, but not detailing the names or even exact numbers of persons involved. So we have, we know the name of Phyllis, and in addition to her specifically, with Phyllis, we remember all the women and girls who lived and worked in slavery at the Wallace house. Mary Maddox um, is the next member of family that we'll uh, encounter. Mary Maddox was born in New Jersey in Burlington County in 1681. While we don't know the exact furniture Mrs. Maddox kept in her bedchamber, uh, here's a glimpse inside her bedchamber as furnished today where we display pieces in the Jacobean style evocative of the 17th century in which Mrs. Maddox was born. Mrs. Maddox later relocated to Philadelphia, uh, where she lived with her second husband, Joshua Maddox, uh, who was a justice of Pennsylvania. Mr. Maddox died before the Revolutionary War, and Mrs. Maddox joined her daughter Mary and her son-in-law John in their removal from Philadelphia to the Wallace House at Hope Farm in the opening years of the war. So with her, daughter and son-in-law left Philadelphia uh, for New Jersey during wartime. Mrs. Maddox was 97 or 98 years old, from what we know, when George Washington was in headquarters at the Wallace House. A chamber chair may have saved her trips downstairs to an outdoor privy, and we have a glimpse of a, of a very impressive antique chamber chair on display in our historic house today in this image. Uh, we can only imagine what Mrs. Maddox thought of the American Revolution and of the young men in Washington's military family who were its leaders, including John Lawrence and Alexander Hamilton, with whom she shared this house in the winter of 1779. Just to imagine this real sort of old representative of the uh, colonial order uh, living alongside these upstart uh, young men, leaders and founders of a new republic. Mrs. Maddox died on August the 5th in 1783, 101 or 102 years old, just a month before the Treaty of Paris brought the Revolutionary War to its formal conclusion. Although she died here at the Wallace House, uh, her body made one last journey to Philadelphia for her burial at Christ Church, the most prominent of Philadelphia's Episcopal churches, uh, with its soaring steeple towering over the port city and still a prominent feature of old city Philadelphia today. Careful visitors to the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia can find Mrs. Maddox's grave in another setting. Revolution Place, the museum's interactive children's exhibit, includes a gravestone listed for Mary Maddox, 1681 to 1783. And I did confirm with the curators that they chose um, Mrs. Maddox to feature as a counterpoint to the often told maxim, they all died so young back then. Uh, so it is true, of course, that uh, uh, many people will die, especially in childbirth, especially in those early years of life. But Mary Maddox is an example that uh, life expectancy on the average after surviving those early years was not necessarily um, shorter. And I, um, I love uh, on tours, I will hear very often when I say that she was 101 years old. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty old for back then. I say, well, I think that's a pretty long life for right now as well, too. And next we'll encounter Hannah Till. So in blue here with the Washington's headquarters flag in the upper right corner, we're back with the people who've traveled here as part of Washington's headquarters. Hannah was 57 years old uh, when she served as a cook in Washington's headquarters at the Wallace House. John Mason, a Presbyterian minister of New York, uh, held Hannah in slavery 
and hired her out for service to General Washington. Hannah traveled with General Washington for seven years during the Revolutionary War, serving at various headquarters, including the Wallace House. So just as there's a lot of travel for Washington and his troops, so too for those people um, in service in the headquarters, including those for whom service is an experience of slavery. Hannah purchased food and supplies for headquarters, a sign of the trust and confidence General Washington and the head, headquarters housekeeper, Mrs. Thompson, placed in her. As a cook, Hannah labored in a temporary kitchen and dining room that stood on the rear of the Wallace House. Um, it's no longer standing today. Today, it faces out towards a road appropriately called uh, Washington Place. And at uh, other headquarters during the war, too, George Washington would order the construction of temporary kitchens and dining rooms to expand uh, the space available for his use uh, from the usual um, domestic spaces of the house that he was, was renting. So this picture here is of the fireplace as it exists in the Wallace House kitchen today to kind of demonstrate, um, although Hannah actually did not work at this fireplace, she would have worked in a hearth in a temporary structure on the rear of the house. While Hannah earned wages for her work, Reverend Mason, as her slaveholder, claimed those wages as his property. Uh, Reverend Mason agreed, however, that after receiving 53 pounds from Hannah's work, he would grant her freedom from slavery. Hannah was enslaved when she first arrived at the Wallace House, and Reverend Mason recorded in December 1778 receipt of payment for Hannah's wages. So we know he received a payment for her wages in that first month when Washington first arrived here. Uh, the next record, however, is in June of 1780, and by that time, Hannah had attained her freedom. An expense report from then indicates payment of wages not to Reverend Mason, but to Hannah alone. And could Hannah have earned that last payment that secured her freedom from slavery during her winter here at the Walls House? Well, we don't know for sure, but interesting to consider her experience of uh, work here in this place. In 1780, uh, by that time, Hannah was now called Hannah Till, taking the surname of her husband, Isaac Till, a black man who was also formerly enslaved, but secured his freedom through payments made to his slaveholder, again, for his services as a cook in Washington's headquarters. Uh, Hannah and Isaac shared the experience of slavery and freedom in service to the commander in chief through the majority of the Revolutionary War. And after the Revolutionary War, Hannah lived with her husband, Isaac, at 182 South 4th Street in Philadelphia. I mentioned earlier, um, Margaret Thomas lived with them for a time. Uh, Hannah died in 1825, 104 years old. Uh, so uh, uh, another uh, long lived um, woman's life. The housekeeper um, in charge of the domestic operations at Washington's headquarters was called Elizabeth Thompson. Elizabeth Thompson was 75 years old when General Washington stayed at the Wallace House, and, when, and she served as housekeeper for Washington's headquarters. So uh, Elizabeth Thompson was a white hired servant who joined headquarters on July 9th, 1776, following the earlier departure of Washington's first housekeeper, Mary Smith. George Washington dismissed Mrs. Thompson after nine months, but reinstated her at Martha Washington's insistence. Showing that Mrs. Washington was influential not only in the private household at Mount Vernon, but also in the military household at headquarters. As housekeeper, Mrs. Thompson supervised hired and enslaved servants, including Hannah Till and Margaret Thomas. Uh, Mrs. Thompson supervised laundry and household cleaning and prepared accommodation for guests. She climbed up and down the staircase, uh, which I've pictured here, kind of the staircase that um, is at the center of the Wallace House, between the temporary kitchen and dining room on the rear of the Wallace House and the bed chambers on the second floor where the Washingtons slept. Mrs. Thompson also carried out certain purchases for George and Martha Washington. Mrs. Thompson was responsible for packing and unpacking Washington's military household as they traveled from headquarters to headquarters. In December of 1778, Mrs. Thompson arranged the arrival of headquarters at the Wallace House, and in June 1779, she organized their departure. And while officially employed by General Washington, when Mrs. Washington was at camp, 
Mrs. Thompson answered to her instructions too. Uh, we know Mrs. Thompson retired from service to General Washington in December 1781, um, not too long after the um, victory in the siege at Yorktown. In September 1783, when General Washington was here again in New Jersey in residence at Rockingham, uh, also preserved in our state historic sites today by our State Park Service, his last wartime headquarters, Washington wrote to Mrs. Thompson in New York, consulting her for help finding a new cook, although it's unclear if um, he ever got a new cook while he was at Rockingham, because the Treaty of Paris would soon arrive, bringing the war to its formal conclusion. In 1785, this is now after the war, Mrs. Thompson wrote to Congress requesting a pension, which they promptly granted. And George Washington later invited her to retire to Mount Vernon. Mrs. Thompson declined General Washington's invitation, choosing to remain in New York. And the place and time of her death um, remain unknown. And for our last woman, another anonymous woman, but we'll step outside the house. We're now facing the rear of the Wallace House. Um, today, um, where, where this picture is taken from is the street Washington Place, but between uh, the back of the house and the present street is where that temporary structure stood that housed a dining room and a kitchen for Washington's um, military household. Beyond the women who worked and lived in General Washington's headquarters was at least one woman, at least one, who served in the Commander in Chief's lifeguard. The lifeguard was a regiment of troops assigned personally to General Washington and entrusted with the security of his headquarters. Orders from earlier in the Revolutionary War indicate one woman was attached to the lifeguard as washerwoman, serving upwards of 40 to 50 men camped in the vicinity of Washington's headquarters. Beyond Washington's headquarters, women served as camp followers throughout the Continental Army, despite General Washington's early chagrin. The commander-in-chief tried to limit the number of women camp followers, directing them to stay off the wagons and his general orders and instructing them to march around towns and cities during formal processions so as not to appear in public with the male soldiers. Uh, George Washington felt they would uh, make the army look not so great having these women marching during the parades. But as the war progressed, General Washington came to recognize the necessity of these women to the army's survival. This um, tour has focused on the women in headquarters at the Wallace House, but that solitary woman who may have camped out with the lifeguard here at Hope Farm reminds us of the extended network of women and girls who served in camp throughout the larger Middlebrook and Pluckman cantonments during the winter of 1778 to 79 and throughout the whole course of the Revolutionary War. After the war in 1788, George Washington wrote to New Jersey's own Annis Stockton, uh, who lived at Morven, today preserved at Morven Museum and Garden in Princeton. And George Washington wrote to Miss Stockton, quote, nor would I rob the fairer sex of their share in the glory of a revolution so honorable to human nature. For indeed, I think you ladies are in the number of the best patriots America can boast. And that's the end quote there of uh, General Washington. So from the ladies who composed his military family to the women who supported his own headquarters as enslaved or hired servants, and all the women who sustained husbands, brothers, and soldiers in the field as camp followers, uh, General Washington, however reluctantly, recognized the essential service of women in securing victory for the cause of the United States in the American Revolution. To conclude, we'll go back to our frame across the street at Old Dutch Parsonage. Um, Old Dutch Parsonage uh, holds ties to two further um, figures and um, movements in the long struggle for women's suffrage in New Jersey and in the United States. Uh, through the grim bonds of slavery, Old Dutch Parsonage is tied to Sojourner Truth, pictured here on the left, the um, activist for the abolition of slavery and for women's rights. Sojourner Truth was born in slavery in Ulster County, New York, um, to the extended family of Jacob Hardenberg, who later lived at Old Dutch Parsonage, first as a student and then as the church minister. And Sojourner Truth grew up speaking only Dutch as her first language uh, for the first nine years of her life and um, brought her Dutch and African Dutch heritage to bear in her later work uh, for the abolition of slavery 
and for um, the rights of women to the vote. In um, to the on the right hand side, then a, a further descendant of the old Dutch Parsonage's Frelinghuysen family is Senator Joseph S. Frelinghuysen Sr. Uh, Joseph uh, Senator Frelinghuysen was the Repub was a Republican senator from New Jersey, who um, in 1919 was among the senators who voted for the passage of the 19th Amendment in the Senate. From there, the 19th Amendment went out to the several states for ratification. New Jersey ratified in 1920, and here at the center from our state archives is the resolution with which the legislature of New Jersey ratified the 19th Amendment. And it was then uh, in 1920 that the women voted in New Jersey again for the, with the first time in major numbers uh, since that, that early provision of suffrage. Senator Frelinghuysen Heisen uh, was not necessarily a leader or activist for suffrage, but in voting for suffrage, whether even, I don't even know if he knew it or not, he was kind of uh, accidentally following his uh, earlier ancestors, uh, Jacob Hardenberg and Colonel Frelinghuysen, who brought suffrage, at least partially, to New Jersey in the first constitution of New Jersey. So with that frame to kind of uh, bring us together, that will conclude our tour of the Walls House from the perspective of these um, 10 um, women. And I think I'm here now to um, take on any additional um, questions or conversation that might like to flow. Our historic houses remain closed, but please do visit um, online in jparksandforest.org and on Facebook at Wallace Dutch. And where we continue to share online historical um, interpretation. And um, please stay safe and well. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, if anybody has any questions um, or comments, you can please uh, submit them using the, the questions portion of the GoToWebinar dashboard. Just type in your question, okay. hit send, and then we'll be happy to, to answer that. Um, all right. I'm a volunteer guide at the Fort Mansion in Morristown. I've been trying to determine the names of Martha's maids and haven't figured it out. Have you tried to research it? And if so, what steps did you take? Sure, great question. Yeah, um, so as you can tell from, uh, and I'll, you know, maybe I'll discuss a little bit too on the various sources I used for this presentation. So as you can tell, I also do not know the names of the enslaved maids um, of Martha Washington. As I said, we know uh, that uh, she was traveling with enslaved maids, and there are some from later, you know, Ona Judge most prominently who is known, but she was not among the maids um, traveling with Martha Washington at this point, um, it, you know, at all during the Revolutionary War. So the short answer is no, I don't know them. Uh, I don't, I'm, I, would expect there's probably a way to find out. And in my, you know, mostly I turned to different sources from um, Mount Vernon. Um, Mary V. Thompson is the senior, you know, historian of Mount Vernon who recently um, had a recent book um, about slavery at Mount Vernon, which I, re I refer to. I did not yet explore it thoroughly, so there might still be more for me to learn from that book. And of course, their focus is on at Mount Vernon not necessarily at headquarters, but if you can line up the dates, right, then you could kind of figure out. So, no, at this time, I don't have names either for the um, enslaved maids who traveled here to the Wallace House, and presumably many of them were the same um, women and girls who, who traveled with Martha Washington to the Ford Mansion the following winter. But I expect there can be some digging <laughs> that might someday, you know, make that make that discovery um, possible to give names and maybe even ages uh, to these women and girls. Uh, a few comments. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, another one said, wonderful presentation. Um, so much and such a rich history previously unknown to me. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Yeah, and uh, you know, so kind of background, the, uh, we participate annually in the Somerset County Weekend Journey Through the Past, and the uh, initial vision for this was drawing on the 19th Amendment anniversary to sort of have a house tour that would 
focus, especially on um, women, you know, who were who were here. Which, when you go through a tour like this, you suddenly realize well, you know, there's a lot of women present at Washington's headquarters. Um, of course, our health uh, precautions right now mean we can't have the tour indoors. So it's been great to be able to translate that information to deliver it in other um, other ways, in, including through this talk today. So I'm glad you're. You know, I'm glad people were able to find it interesting and uh, useful. And of course, hopefully someday, again, you're all welcome to come and, and visit our historic houses when it's uh, safer and healthier times to, to do that. All right. My wife and I visited these two historic houses last year and noted the state of repair of the parsonage. What are the plans there? Sure. Yeah, great concerns that you're raising. Um, yeah, you know, the houses are both owned um, by the state of New Jersey and administered um, through our state park service. Um, yeah, the parsonage in particular has um, an issue with the, um, you know, he's, I mean, he's in need of all kinds of different care, but especially the, the, um, the shutters, which there is a, a, a an issue related to the possibility of lead paint being in them that delays taking immediate action. You know, we can't necessarily do that work in-house through our own state park maintenance. We either, we need to get, um, kind of an outside contractor support to do that. Um, I don't have any real good immediate answers. What I can tell you is, as the interpretive staff, at least for, for my part, I've been trying to work with our superintendent to hopefully identify uh, other sources of funds we might be able to use to carry out some of the, the necessary work on the, on the house's preservations. Um, and also we are hopeful that the upcoming um, Revolution NJ anniversaries of the United States and of the Revolutionary War in 2026 um, will open up opportunity for, for funding there. Um, I don't think I'm speaking outside the schoolroom to say that we were hopeful that additional um, internal funding would come prior to the outbreak of the um, pandemic. And of course, public health emergency has rightly uh, you know, caused um, the diversion of resources to, to, to tackle immediate issues of public health. Um, but I, if you're interested in getting involved, you know, please do check out the Wallace House and Old Dutch Parsonage Association, who is a volunteer group and a nonprofit that supports our historic sites and is kind of you know, the best way for if individuals want to get involved in expressing their support and interest. Um, you know, they're an independent nonprofit, but they work very closely with me as the interpretive staff to uh, um, bring interpretive programs, but hopefully also bring the awareness that in turn, um, we hope might lead to um, some of those you know, improvements uh, that you're mentioning. Um, another person has said, interesting and informative. I loved it. Um, fascinating program. Hope there are more virtual tours to follow. Thank you. Yeah, and if you enjoy that, um, do check out um, on njparksandforest.org under education and interpretation. To tab on the left-hand side of the website, a um, number of our historic sites and parks have, you know, everyone, we're kind of trying to ramp up our online presence while we're operating remotely. Or um, on social media, we're using this hashtag NJParksFromHome. So you can find um, you know, a variety of just little different, sometimes short videos or, or little written excerpts from different historic sites and parks. Um, did enslaved women sleep in the same bedroom with Martha Washington? Yeah, an excellent question. Um, and I, I will talk more generally because I don't know about the specific case of Martha Washington, but just to speak in general. So what we have in the Wallace house is, um, you know, domestic slavery, right? As opposed to, um, kind of the larger scale agricultural or plantation slavery. And I'm always very careful when I try, when I try to distinguish these things, it's not to suggest to begin to debate whether one is better than the other is a rather useless discussion to have, you know, all these cases are experiencing slavery, but it is interesting to understand the nuance of how slavery in certain circumstances, you know, had, you know, led to different living conditions or, or, or different, um, uh, days, daily schedules. So when we're talking about enslaved maids of Martha Washington or even enslaved servants in the Wallace family, those people are more or less sleeping, living wherever it is they work. So in the case of a lady's maid or a gentleman's valet in slavery, 
um, she or he would probably live either in the bedchamber or in a passage just outside the bedchamber, or at the very least, you know, in another section of the house, maybe a, a garret attic or, or even a, a cellar. Um, the case of a cook's, right, they might even live just above the kitchen in kind of small garret spaces. And we believe that uh, a small garret above the Wallace House kitchen was most likely um, where some of the, at least some of the enslaved servants lived. Yeah, and, and you know, then in terms of the, in case of, you know, that's kind of a general experience. And, and, and that is because, you know, someone in that condition is really on, on call all the time. Um, you talk about, in the sense, you have a better structure, perhaps, on the most basic level, than um, in kind of those large-scale plantations where enslaved people would live in a in a in kind of ramshackle little huts and and villages. But the distinction that you know historians will make is that, at least in those circumstances, we know that um, on on plantations, oftentimes, the people in slavery would sort of build a community. They had a space. However tenuous, they had a space that was sort of their own and would build their own community life there. If you are a domestic um, person, domestic slavery, you know, your, your opportunity to reach out beyond that work is really limited because your whole day revolves around um, those people you know, whom you're forced to serve. And so you know, it's, it's certainly not that it's better that you're under a roof because you, know, you could be up to call any moment of day or night and, and it's hard to develop any kind of relationship beyond that house although you know we know right and that's what's remarkable right, about the resilience of these people right we can see how someone like hannah and isaac till um developed a relationship in washington's headquarters got married and later lived together you know found their own home in philadelphia as a married couple um so so that's kind of a, a long explanation just to give a sense of of the daily experience in general there might be more documents around martha washington that could indicate exactly what was the preference or the, the or in her case i just don't know them off the top of my head but what i do know is uh, billy lee who we kind of he's a man so we're focused on the women today but billy lee was the enslaved valet or body man of uh, george washington and interestingly um when they were out in the field under washington's tent billy lee was the only man or woman who ever shared a tent with George Washington during the war. So his sleeping tent, he had sort of a folding bed, and then Billy Lee would have slept in kind of an exterior portion of that tent, uh, which again is not suggest any kind of uh, you know, special favor or friendship even, but what it does suggest is a close confidence and reliance really um, that you know in such a sensitive place as a military camp, Washington would meet with other generals and officers in other tents, but in his own sleeping tent, um, the only woman or man with whom he would share it was um, was Billy Lee. Uh, so, so it is an it's an it's an intimate relationship. Obviously, always always with that you know essential difference of slavery on top of it, but but it's important to remember how close their, these daily lives were lived. Um, more accolades, very informative program. He's a terrific speaker, um, very good presentation. Most of this was new to me and I enjoyed it very much. Looking forward to being able to visit. Uh, thanks for the tip on the volunteer support group. I'll look that up. Uh, thank you for a splendid informative program and thank you, great information. If anybody has any more questions, please feel free to uh, send them using the questions box and we'll give it another minute or so. Okay. While we're doing that, Paul, I wanna echo everybody's, uh, you know, comments uh, on this presentation. I, I just thought it was very good and it was very informative and it was, you know, a place, again, that I had told you the other day when we were talking that I had never heard of, and I've lived in New Jersey my whole life. Um, and, uh, you know, you guys know my age about, because remember I said that I knew what eight tracks were, and uh, and yes, I have used a dial phone, so hey. Um, 
But I just want to thank you for this presentation. It was it was really well done. I love the way that you tied in showing us the building with telling us about the women. And I just thought that was a really great way to tie it in and to, to be able to give us a tour of the place while informing us about the women that were in the household. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad we could connect and I'm glad that you reached out to me because you reached out to me for this presentation and something else. And so I'm glad that you did that. And thank you for that. Sure, I'll, I'll say my little um, final thank you to um, <laughs> you as our host at the State Library and all those who joined in that uh, I, I said earlier, I always like when I'm able to get to the talks at the State Library, that nice love seat up in the front. <laughs> and well, I didn't expect that I'd give the presentation from my own love seat. But <laughs> thanks for keeping this all going now and you know keeping people healthy and safe and um, looking forward, of course, to when yeah you know, we'll be able to meet again in Trenton. Very good. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So again, on behalf of the State Library, oh. We just got one. Uh, what was Hannah's surname before her marriage? So before her marriage, um, she was, I think, in some documents called Hannah Mason, you know, to, you know this, this, which is really the surname of her slaveholder. Um, and and so, the, you know, that, that's how she was referred to in documents. And, and basically, that's kind of what the, the um, indication is in the paper, I guess. And I'm borrowing from, uh, especially for this one, from um, Nancy Loam. Who is a who work is a historian at Valley Forge, but who published a book on um, on women camp followers at Valley Forge, and then with some thoughts on them throughout the war. So I'm really um, relying on her research and the primary documents for this. But yes, yeah, so she's mostly called either Hannah or Hannah Mason. Oftentimes, people in slavery um, were not either did not have surnames or at least were not recognized with their surnames. Um, and that's kind of, you know, grimly part of the way that um, their sort of citizenship or even human status is kind of denied, right? You know, they, they sort of, they have a, a, a given name, but without a proper surname, you know, they're sort of considered not, um, not, 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 not um, full citizens or even full humans. And so oftentimes people in slavery who then um, attain freedom, you know, will take a name. And, and in this case, Hannah, Mason took the name of uh, Isaac Till, whom she married. Now, I don't know where Isaac Till got that name, uh, but that's that's where um, she came. And and you met I you know I mentioned earlier Margaret um, Thomas, um, who was it appears was was probably married to Billy Lee. Um, she is sometimes called Peggy Lee. So in a sense, she took the name Lee. Um, men like George Washington uh, would would not have recognized. Uh, her as a Lee, but um, she herself did because of her her relationship and most likely marriage with Billy Lee. Thank you. Alrighty, well, uh, again, on behalf of the New Jersey State Library, thank you, Paul, for a fantastic presentation. We loved having you. Thank you, Cindy, for all the wonderful work you do in getting uh, these author talks um, up and running. And lastly, thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, we really appreciate your desire to, to attend our programming and support us. And we just hope that everybody stays safe, stay well, and hopefully we can see you again soon.